Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God in sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold Him come, offspring of a virgin word veiled in flesh the Godhead see hail the incarnate deity pleased as man with man to dwell Jesus our Emmanuel hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn heaven-born prince of peace hail the son of righteousness light and life to all he brings risen with healing in his wings mild he lays his glory by born that man no more may die born to raise the sons of earth born to Hallelujah. You can be seated just for a moment. I'm going to ask the ushers if you would come on around at this time, and we're going to prepare to receive the morning tithe and offerings. And once again, just ask the Lord, what would you have me to do? And if you will obey him, I promise you, you know what the word says? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. Amen. God's not worried about, do you sacrifice once in a while? No, he's, a, he's asking, do you walk in obedience? Amen. That's what it's all about. That's why I ask you, pray and ask the Lord, what would you have me to do? Walk in obedience to him. Amen. Destin, would you ask the blessing today and the gift and the giving? Heavenly Father, we just thank you today, Lord God, that we can come into your house, Lord God, that we have the freedom to do so, Lord God, and that we have the, you know, each, each one of us have, have the ability to give I'm thankful that you have blessed us in that way. Yes, Lord. Lord. And there are those who don't have gifts, Lord, and I, I pray that you would bless them also. And I just I just pray that all of this would be to the betterment of your kingdom in Jesus' yes, name. Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Now let's worship him as we give. Let the poor man say, I am rich in him. Let the lost man say, I am found in him. Let the river flow. Let the blind man say, I can see again. Let the dead man say, I am born again. Let the river flow.
Let the poor man say, I am rich in him. Let the lost man say, I am found in him. Let the river flow. Let the blind man say, I can see again. Let the dead man say, I am born again. Let the river flow. Come on, make that your prayer today. Let the the river flow let the river flow let the river flow Let the river flow. Let the river flow. Lord, that's our prayer today. Let the power of the Holy Ghost just sweep through this place, Lord God. Father, sweep through our soul. Move in our lives, Lord God. Draw our focus back where it needs to be, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord Jesus. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy to receive glory. Worthy to receive honor. Worthy to receive all our praise today. him up praise him exalt his name forever praise him praise him and lift him up praise him exalt his name forever Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, you're worthy. Lord, you're worthy. Praise Him, praise Him and lift Him up, praise Him, exalt His name forever, praise Him, praise Him and lift Him up. Exalt his name forever. Holy, 
holy, holy, holy, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's worthy to receive glory, worthy to receive honor. All I praise today. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Exalt His name forever. Praise Him. Praise Him and lift Him up. Praise Him. Exalt His name forever. Lord, we bless Your name. We praise You today, Holy God. You are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but did anybody else feel the shift in the atmosphere halfway through that song? It was like everything was a fight until that point. And all of a sudden, there was just a sweet anointing that filled this place. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you, Lord God, for the anointing. The Lord, the anointing breaks every chain. We thank you for freedom that we have in you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that we can walk in wholeness because of what you have done through Jesus Christ and because of Calvary. And now, Lord, I ask, Lord God, for a special anointing as we open the word. Father, let this not just be another Christmas message, but let it be the truth truth the word of life that breaks through the bondage lord and lord we're believing for a breakthrough in lives now in jesus name amen and amen you can be seated if you can for those who are online if you think i sound funny i do uh, i've been fighting i don't know what it is i've been on antibiotics all week long trying to get over it and i'm better but i'm not well so we're going to go and if my voice breaks just laugh at me and we'll laugh together all right i want to talk about christmas with isaiah this morning how many know that throughout the old testament i've been i've probably been harping about this a lot lately but it bothers me because i keep seeing it over and over people talk, trying to throw away the old testament but you can't do that if you throw away the Old Testament, you don't even understand what the New Testament is about. But throughout the Old Testament, there are literally hundreds of passages that tell us, prophesy about the coming Messiah. And it's important that you know those. And if we took time this morning, it would take us all morning into the, to tonight. We're not going to do that. My voice wouldn't hold up that long. But let me just go back and remind you where we are. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in that creation, he created a garden of Eden. And there he placed Adam and Eve who walked with God. Let me just go ahead and give you a scripture before I forget. Isaiah chapter 9, if you'd turn there and just hold your spot. I'll get to that eventually. And we know that in that garden, everything was perfect. I don't know about you, that's hard for me to imagine. But it was perfect until Adam and Eve sinned. The word tells us at, at that time, this just um, absolutely blows my mind, that the Lord came and walked in the garden with them. A while back, you know, I've been serving the Lord a long time, but I really got to focusing on it, and I, I got to thinking this was a pre-incarnate visit of Jesus. That he would literally come down and walk in the cool of the garden with them. But when sin entered in, 
He couldn't find them because they realized there had been a break in the relationship with them because that's what sin does. It severs our relationship with God. My favorite thing of that whole story is God could have said, oh, well, let me go start over. He could have just wiped them out, but he went looking for them. And he called out, Adam, where are you? And he, please hear what I'm trying to say to you today. So many times when we fall into sin in our life, it does, does not measure up. The devil comes along because this is what he does, accusing you. And he tries to tell you God doesn't care about you. God's mad at you. God's going to squash you like a bug. But God, just like he did with Adam and Eve, comes looking for you. That's why you feel conviction. That's why people that pester you to death call you up and say, hey, I've been missing you. Don't get mad at them. They're doing the work of God. God is saying, I care about you. I still love you, and I want to restore the relationship with you. And that's what happened in the garden, that he went looking for them. We know that God slew the first animal, made coats and covered them, which was a type or a shadow, if you will, of what would happen on the cross. Then down through the ages, as God shaped history, he revealed more and more of his plan of salvation, that what took place in the garden was just a hint, if you will, of what was going to happen down the road when he sent a Messiah, a Savior for us. God told how the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and we can go on and on that he, he told us, you know, it's interesting as you study the Old Testament, you see that he revealed a little bit more and a little bit more, you know, and it's kind of the way, you know, we've probably done that with people. We've got a secret, right? And so we want to tell them, and we give them just a little bit. We keep them excited. God did the same thing. He, he, he told them that there is a Savior coming. And he told them, speaking through the prophets, he narrowed the, the lineage down little bit by little, but he said it would come through the lineage of Abraham. And then he narrowed it down that it would come through Isaac and then through David. And he said that a Messiah would come born in the city of David. God told how the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. In the book of Micah, if you go back and read it, in Zechariah, he spoke about how that, speaking of himself, he said I, that he would be pierced for our transgressions. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah described him as a suffering servant who would bear our sins. I know I've told this story many times, but every Christmas time, it kind of comes back to me. Many, many years ago, back in the 90s, we were pastoring in Danville, Illinois, and we had a couple that attended our church, and her sister was a very bad drug addict. And I loved that girl dearly, and she would come to church every now and then, and she would get so close, and she would run away. I got a call late one Sunday night to go down to Cindy and Troy's house, and when I got there, there sat the sister, messed up out of her mind on drugs. And we began to plead with her and share with her God's plan of salvation. And I will never forget her words. She said, Pastor, I believe every word you're saying. She said, I wouldn't keep coming back to church. And I wouldn't keep coming back to my family if I didn't believe it to be true. She said, but I don't deserve it. And I said, Brenda, what you don't understand is there's not one of us who deserves it. I said, we may not all be drug addicts, but we've all died to the spiritual us in sin. And not one of us deserves it. What we deserve is death. But God said, I'm going to be pierced for you. You don't have to wallow in your sin any longer. You don't have to pay the price for your sin. All you have to do is trust in my Savior that I'm sending. That brings us to our passage today. I could go through Scripture all day long, and there's well over 300 that I've come up with so far, and I just stopped. But there's at least 300 passages that prophesy about the coming Savior. Do the mathematical odds. I wish my son was here. He was going to try to because he could do it instantly in his head. But the odds of all of those being fulfilled in one event, are astronomical. 
But let's focus on one. In Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet writes in verse number 6. We're just going to look at that one verse today. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Now, let me just stop. Somebody asked me about that one. What is that one? That means eternal. The eternal Father. Matter of fact, I think it's in the NIV. It translates it that way. And the Prince of Peace. I want to take this verse today and just break it down for a few moments. For unto us a child is born. Let me ask you something this morning. Just kind of steal your mind just for a moment. And I'm going to say a word, and I want you to, you don't have to say it out loud, but I want you to focus on the thought that comes. When I say baby, what do you think of? I promise you, not one person here thought of might. Not one person thought of power or strength. But when I say baby, you probably thought words like innocence, weak, dependent, precious. We could go on and on. But, but my point is, we didn't think about majesty. We think cute. We think vulnerable. We think needs protection. Some of you probably thought, oh, I love them. See, the preciousness of life is best seen in the frailty of a newborn baby. It's not by accident that God chose to enter into this world through a baby. He did that so that we could get a glimpse. How much more should we value the precious life of baby Jesus? Who when he came to the earth, he didn't come riding in on a white horse like he's going to when he returns. He came as a precious, vulnerable, innocent, tender baby. Delivered from his mother's womb in the same way that you and I entered into this world. Don't miss that. It's important that Jesus entered the world. It says that he understands, and I talked about this last week, he understands every trial, every pain, everything we've experienced, including birth. See, we have no capacity to understand I was talking to my wife. I said, can you imagine what it would be like to be Jesus? You are part of the triune God, and you came. Understand this, and this is so hard for us to wrap our brains around. Fully God, but fully human. And what it means is this. I, 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 I've said this many times, and some people get angry with me, but it bothers me. I don't like seeing all these painted nativity scenes with Jesus with a halo. Because what you don't understand is, yes, he was fully God, but when he came clothed in flesh, he laid aside his glory. He laid aside his power. He laid aside all of those things that are a part of who he is as God. He still owned them. Please hear me. But he chose to lay them aside so that we, he could experience life as we live it. And I don't know about anybody else, but I started to say we, but I don't have the capacity in my limited thinking to understand the humiliation. To know I'm laying this aside to come and make myself vulnerable. I'm, I've wrestled with saying this today because somebody could sure take it wrong, and please don't. But I'm sure I'm not the only person. Have you ever had something that because of your life experience and your skills, somebody comes along trying to show you something that you know much more than they do about it? 
But rather than hurt them or cut them off, you just kind of swallow your pride and you let them show you. I'll be honest, that's a hard thing to do. My, my wife says to me all the time, say, could you just not let me? Because she'll try to tell me something, and I'm like, I already know. And I, I'm not trying to be offensive, but it's difficult. Jesus laid aside all knowledge, all power, all glory, everything that makes him God. He took it off set it aside temporarily and made himself vulnerable and dependent just like you and I. See, it, I, I can't get off it. It's unfathomable to me to think God loved me so much that he would humiliate himself. You have to understand this. I talked about this some last week in John 1, 1, where it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us or dwelt among us. He came as a child. In that moment of Jesus' birth, the infinite, most powerful God took on weakness. The majestic of all majesty became meek and humble. The creator of the universe made himself subject to us, to mankind. You have to comprehend that the infinite, eternal, self-sustaining being that God is, the one that created everything, put every star in its place, every planet in its place, created everything, made himself dependent upon his mother's breast. He loved you that much. As a child, the eternal son was in a state of submission to the will of his parents when he had the power. My wife asked me today, said, at what point do you think he gained that knowledge of who he was? I don't know. I do know he had that knowledge by the time he was 12 because of the story that tells us when he went to the temple and he said, did you not know it had to be about my father's business? At some point in there, and I'm not going to get into all that today, but God made himself subject. Can you imagine God had to listen to his mom say, eat your broccoli? but I don't like broccoli. I said, eat your broccoli. Now, I don't know. Maybe that discussion didn't happen, but similar things happen. What I'm trying to get you to understand, I've had conversations with Sister Naomi about this. Every parent thinks they're the only one. Ha! You know better, and you know your kids know better. And you tell them, and they don't do it. How many believe Jesus went through that? He was human just like the rest of us. Did you wash behind your ears? Yeah, Mom. At some point, though, let me just get moving. The thing that blows my mind is that Jesus, part of the triune God, is born in a stable. Now think about it. We have a guest coming. We want to put them in the best room. We want to make sure that, you know, if we don't have a place in the house, we go get them the room at the Holiday Inn or whatever it may be, but we want to give them the best, and we prepare the best meals. But Jesus is born in a humble manger. In that moment is a display of God's infinite love and his humility. At birth, please don't ever miss this, at Jesus' birth, as beautiful as that nativity scene is, I promise you it wasn't that pretty. But we see 
the beginning of the work of redemption of God's plan being carried out. I, I'm afraid so many people miss that. It's one of my, my favorite scenes. I've seen it many, many times. Ironically, the first time I ever saw it was when we happened to pastor in Danville. We were driving down the road one night, and if I remember correctly, my wife spotted it first, and she said, did you see that? And we turned around and looked. There was a nativity scene, but the manger was empty, and behind it was a cross standing lit up. Because you need to understand, in that nativity scene is the beginning of the path to the cross. That's God's plan. At his birth is the beginning of all of the fulfillment of all the prophecies given in the Old Testament. Now, here's a question. What did the word, this part of the Godhead, give up to become a child, a baby? The word says in that passage, for unto us, I, I love the wording. It doesn't say in that prophecy, unto a certain couple. It says, unto us a child is given. Unto us a son is born. It speaks of the incarnation that we talked about last week, God clothing himself in flesh. In John chapter 1, I'm not going to go through it all again, but it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And if you skip down to verse number 14, it says, And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Then if we skip over a little bit farther in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, it says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. In Hebrews chapter 2, it says, But we do not see him who has been made for us a little lower than the angels. This is speaking of his humility. We do not see, or we do see him who has been made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And then in Luke, it says, And Jesus kept increasing in his wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And again, I just want to plug in the thought there. You have to understand that shows us that God laid aside his omnipotence, his power, his knowledge. But he grew as he tuned in more and more to the Holy Spirit, he grew in that knowledge. He came as one of us. He became one of us that he might experience what we experience. But here's the key. He experienced it without sin. And because he experienced it without sin, he could go to the cross to die for us. I learned something just a couple of days ago. I was so excited to tell my wife, and I think she got it, but I don't think it really hit her like it hit me, and it may not hit you the same way. But I was reading, and it was talking about when Jesus was born, the prophecies said it, and then it says when he was born, they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. I'm almost 60 years old, and I've never heard the definition of swaddling clothes before this week. you got to understand that in that region there, they raised the lambs that would be used for the sacrifice. Well, now why is it Jesus was born there? Because he came as the lamb who would be the sacrificial lamb for us. When those baby lambs were born, if you understand the Old Testament, it tells us that the sacrificial lamb had to be without spot or blemish. Couldn't have a bruise on it. So they took cloth and they wrapped the legs of those baby lambs and they wrapped its body called swaddling clothes to keep him from ever being bruised. When Jesus was born, they prophesied and it was fulfilled, he will be wrapped in swaddling clothes. It was a statement, this little baby is the lamb of God. 
that it comes to take away the sin of the world. He came to be just like us, but he walked a sinless life. He came like us to set us free. He came and lived among us to guide us, to lead us, to teach us. And he died on a cross to set us free from the disastrous consequences of sin. And to tell us there is more coming in the life to come. But the key is, and I I can't overemphasize this, he did not stay dead. He rose from the grave to prove that his sin sacrifice was acceptable to the Father. You see, people miss that. If he just died, he's just another man. All of this was for no reason. But because the Spirit of God rose him from the dead, it's the Father said it, Jesus said it on the cross, the Father says back, It is finished. The sacrifice has been paid. All you or I have to do today is to say, Lord Jesus, I accept your sacrifice. See, that was the problem with Brenda that I was talking about. She could not accept that somebody else would have to suffer for what she did. He didn't have to. He chose to. In that child laying in the manger, the majesty of God, the glory of God, the omnipresent God, the all-powerful God submitted himself for a temporary season to the arms of his mother. He did that because he loved us. His being a son that was given is a gift from God. Please hear this. Somebody was just saying to me the other day, said, oh, we're not going to have Christmas. And I said, why are you not having Christmas? Oh, we don't have the money to buy gifts. And I said, you have missed the whole point. See, it doesn't matter if there's gifts under our trees. I know we all like that and we get our feelings hurt. Get over yourself because that's not what Christmas is about. It is about the gift that was given to us long ago in Bethlehem. In that child, a son was given to us, the gift from the Father to anybody who will say, I will receive that gift. See, it was the Father who sent the Son. John 8, 18 says, I am he who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness with me. In other words, God and I are in agreement. I am here for a reason. I'm here to pay a price. In John 3, 16, we know it so well, but I wonder, do we really grasp the meaning of it? For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that none of us need perish. What, What do we do? Do we act well? Do we give so much? No, that whosoever believes on him, whoever puts their trust in him, should not perish somebody needs to get that the devil keeps saying oh you can't make it you can't make it god says you will make it because the price has already been paid all you do is say lord jesus it's not my goodness it's not my righteousness it's yours and i receive it see the word did not give up his deity i want to make that clear in that manger As much as he was human, he was still fully God. He did not give up his deity when he joined human nature to become the person of Jesus Christ. Instead, he cooperated, if you will, with humanity. He laid aside. It's one thing. We've all seen the, the, the stories, the fairy tales and stuff, where the king acts like a pauper. If you will, doesn't do justice, but that's kind of what Jesus did. He's still king. He's still Lord. He's still God. But he put on flesh so that he could walk among the rest of us. He did not give that up. In Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, it says, Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. Get this 
who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of man, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Paul says there that when he, the word took on flesh, the eternal took on mortality. The infinite became the finite. There was limit to what he could do during that time. The glory of all glory put on dirty sandals. The majestic wore clothing just like you and I, not royal robes. Get this. This is, is mind-boggling to me when I stop and really think about this. The one who created us walked among us. Does that just mess with anybody else's mind? The God who created us walked among us on this earth showing his eternal love. Now, here's the part I think throws a lot of people. In that prophecy, it says, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. What does that mean? You know, when we think government, we think Donald Trump, Barack Obama, and all that kind of nonsense. The Hebrew word government in Hebrew is Mizra. I love that, how close it is to misery. Here's the thing that is, I'm, I know not everybody's word personally. I know Destin's kind of like me. I, I'm really into words and knowing the etymology and the meaning. This word government is used two times in all of the scripture. And both of them are in this passage. In verse 7 and 8. Mizra is translated government. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David over all of his kingdom. The wording here was important to them back in that time, just like it is today, but to them it was specific because government to the Israel, Israel people was seen as a burden. It was seen as bondage, if you will especially when they were under subjugation to the foreign powers of government having to do what they demanded, kind of like we are today. So when government is mentioned, they symbolized a key. And here's the best way I could illustrate it to us today. If you have somebody who's in the military, some of you have been in the military, you've got family members, they have a way of designating rank or authority of people. How do they do that? They put stripes on their shoulders. What does it hit? The government shall be upon his shoulders. It's saying the authority that rests in him rests on his shoulders. See, the, the sign of a military rank is that insignia, if you will, worn on a soldier whatever it may be, Navy, Army, doesn't matter. But in its context that is used here in Isaiah 9, it speaks a rebuttal against the oppression that Israel is under. It says in Isaiah 9, 4, it says, For you shall break the yoke of their burden. See, this is why it's so important to keep things in context. We always quote 7 and 8. But go back a couple of verses in verse number four it says, For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, is in the battle of Midian. He says, This baby who's coming is the one who will break the bondage and the oppression that has been put upon you, and he is authorizing a new authority that Jesus now says, the same authority that I have, I now give to you. So when it says the government shall be upon his shoulders, most people just say, oh, it just means he's going to reign forever. In its simplest form, that's it. But he says the authority that is recognized in him, Jesus said, it's yours. You are no longer subject to every whim of Satan who comes at you. 
You are no longer subject to all of the things that we think we're under. We, you know, people have asked, I've been asked at least six times this week, do you believe in pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. And I frankly don't care. I know this. He's coming. I'm going to be ready, and I'm going to live. Jesus said this church, get this. He didn't say sit around twiddling your thumbs. He said occupy until I come. Occupy means the same word we get, occupation, get busy. If you're not getting busy, you're not understanding this thing about the government being upon his shoulders. Because when Jesus left and he said, I'm leaving, and I'll pray the Father that he send another comforter unto you, and he will empower you to do the work that I have been doing. That's what we're supposed to be doing right now. Christmas is not about, oh, one day in the great day beyond, one day I'm going to get out of this world. No, Christmas is about the power and the authority that Jesus came to give to us, the church, that we can carry on the work of God. That's what it's talking about when it says the government will be upon his shoulders. This verse is talking about the kingly aspect of ministry. People get all shook up because a lot of people, they, take, they say, oh, kingly aspect of ministry. Now the pastor's getting full of himself. I, nobody said anything about pastor. Ministry is every born-again believer. Every one of us, if some of you have been around long enough, you remember a few years ago, I preached a whole series about us being priests and kings. God's children are priests and kings. You are not meant to be wallowing in the dirt. You're to walk in the power and the authority that Jesus walked in. It's yours. Jesus said, here's the key that people miss. Jesus said in John chapter 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, a lot of people take that to mean that it's not in this world. That's not what he said. Your power is not worldly power. It's in the spirit realm. How many times do I have to say it? You are not the flesh and blood that I'm looking at. In you, there is a spirit man. That's God's kingdom. It is a spiritual kingdom. What are you doing in the spirit realm? The problem is, it's just like today. I'm telling you, in my flesh, I wanted to tell my wife, call Jack. My throat hurts. My head hurts. I told her, I said, I don't think I can get through preaching today. And I'm fighting in my body. But my spirit man says, there is a word that has to go forth. And your spirit rises up and you say, I'm not subject to this flesh. Church, it's time that we start walking in the kingdom of God and understand that we have a power dwelling in us that is greater than this flesh. See, we are called not to be in this world or of this world. We are in it, but not of this world. We are called to walk in kingdom authority. Let's move on. And his name will be called. I'm getting ready to get myself in trouble with somebody. Everybody wants to separate this. His name shall be called Wonderful. His name shall be called Counselor. But if you read it, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Not just a counselor. How many know everybody's got a piece of advice for you? I don't want just any piece of advice. I don't want to take a poll and see what the majority thinks. I want the best advice out there. He is wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father, the Prince is of Peace. In his name exhibits four aspects that should be our character. Because it's his character. If it's his character and we are now born again, it should be our character. But let's deal with him first. These specific titles do not appear anywhere in the New Testament. Now hear me. If you listen to those knuckleheads who tell you to throw away the Old Testament, you miss this. Nowhere in the New Testament do you find these titles. But they reference Jesus. The Messiah. 
How can we know him without knowing what the Old Testament tells us? How many know names in the Bible mean something? Nowadays, people just come up with the strangest things. Orangelo. It's orange jello if you don't know. See, think about the probably the closest we can come to it is not... I started to say the Indian heritage, but politically correct, I can't call it Indian, Native American. The Native Americans would name their children Running Bear or Flying Eagle. The names meant something. It defined who they were, their character. Well, even more so, in the Old Testament, in biblical times, names meant something. In Genesis chapter 5, the genealogy that is given in the English, it says, it is appointed to mortal men's sorrow, but the blessed of God will come down. When he dies, it will come, bringing to the despairing rest. Now, just hold on to that. Those names are important because we see wonderful counselor. In John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit. Did you notice he just gave the Holy Spirit a name? The helper or comforter. Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, lead you in all things and bring to remembrance the things which I have said to you. He'll be your helper, your counselor. In Acts 2.22, says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Jesus gave us wisdom and teaching. Wonderful counselor. I keep coming back to this because it's one of the most crucial things, and I've said it over and over in 2018, more than I've ever said it in my life. Church, if you don't know the word, you don't know the mind of Christ. He gave us the word. Who was he called before he came in the flesh? The word. The word is vital to your life. Listen, I'm thankful for people who come to hear me speak and tune in online. I'm thankful for people to send and ask for my advice. But guess what? It's not Daryl Garrett you need. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God that will cause you to stand because He is wonderful counselor. You need counsel in your life. You don't need to make an appointment with me. You need to make an appointment with the Word of God. He's mighty God. It says in, again in John 1, 14, I'm not going to read it again, but also in John 20, verse 28, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to his disciples, flesh and blood did not reveal these things to you. Hebrews 1, 8 says, but of the Son, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. He is. Now get this. When we think of mighty God, we think of the risen Savior. But that little baby laying in the manger is mighty God. If you lose sight of the fact that that baby's mighty God, you will never appreciate the risen Savior as mighty God. Mighty God loves you so much that he laid down his life and his power and his glory to come subject as a baby. And he's the everlasting father or eternal father, depending on which translation. Get this. This is where people get so messed up in their minds, not understanding the Trinity. Jesus says in John 30, I and the Father are one. John 14, 9, Jesus said to them, Have I been with you 
excuse me, let me back up and read that and get it right. Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has sent me has seen the Father, or he who has seen me has seen the Father. I'm going to read that again because I want to get it right. I don't want anybody confused. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you? Talking to Philip. And yet you have not come to know me. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you then say, Show us the Father? When you see Jesus, you see the Father. Hebrews 1, 3. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Let me, let me kind of illustrate that for you. People are always asking me, I, I just don't know what God wants. It's as simple as anybody remember the WWJD? What would Jesus do? It became so cliche. You want to know the will of Jesus? What would Jesus do? Or the will of the Father? What would Jesus do? Because Jesus and the Father are one. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation. In other words, when you look at Jesus, you're seeing a mirror reflection of the Father. In Revelation 1.18, he says, And the living one, and I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. Now, I'm going to just, this is going to mess with somebody right here. When Jesus clothed himself in flesh, I shared this last week, he did not just begin, but in a sense, he was born again. Don't get too carried away with that because here's what i want you to see that baby grew up in the flesh went to the cross in the flesh died in the flesh rose in the flesh and ascended in the flesh jesus is eternally in that flesh that's exactly what we just read in revelation let me read it again and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and hell. And then it says he's the prince of peace. I'm going to wind this down. Luke chapter 2 says, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among men. With whom he is pleased. I'm going to blow your minds. Because we, we create all of this false understanding. D Jesus did not bring peace. He was peace. When it said peace on earth, it's referring to Jesus. Now a bunch of knuckleheads want to go out and make songs and talk about, you know, is it really Christmas? And they try to use Christianity to destroy the wars. and all. That's not what it's talking about. If you read the New Testament, you'll see Jesus said that I've come and my coming is going to bring strife. He is peace. He didn't bring peace. He is peace. What he's saying, in the midst of the conflict, in the midst of the war, in the midst of all the chaos, the peace is not an emotional experience you're going to have. The peace is in Jesus. If you want peace, uh, people say, oh, I love coming into the church at candlelight communion. Yeah, we're going to do one, by the way. And it is wonderful, but I'm telling you, that's not the peace he brought. The peace is the peace that was separated way back when in Genesis. The peace is that which puts us and God back in relationship. Because that's what the conflict is really all about, is we're separated from God. 
Jesus said, in that thought, think about this. Jesus says, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I, he didn't say some other emotional experience, I will give you rest. The rest is in knowing I'm in harmony with God because of Jesus. Colossians 1.20 says, And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The peace is restoration of relationship with Father because of Christ. Would you just bow your heads? You see, for the world... Several of us were talking about this afterwards last week. People think, oh, pastor hates Christmas. I don't hate Christmas. I hate what we've made Christmas. The world, Christmas is a bunch of commercial nonsense. It's people fighting one another, shooting one another over a big screen TV or a pair of tennis shoes. Trampling on one another. Putting yourself in debt so that you can give kids a gift that you really can't afford and they don't really need. That's Christmas to us. Because we have forgotten what Christmas is about. God sent a baby in a manger to redeem us to reconcile us because we were separated. And he says, anybody who receives my son. Jack, we just whispered it back there, receives me. <laughs> Do you understand? We have made it so stinking complicated. It is as simple as saying, Lord, Jesus, hear me, somebody. You can say it this way. Lord, I don't even really understand it all. But I get the idea. You love me. And you came for me. And I receive you. That's Christmas, church. And we can have Christmas 365 days of the year. See, for the Christian... Christmas is a time of celebration, but it's not just on December 24th and December 25th. It's, Lord, I thank you on June 23rd <laughs> that I'm still redeemed. I thank you on August 1st that even though I've lived and acted like a fool, I'm still redeemed. <laughs> Even though I've blown it, Lord God, I have relationship with you because Jesus came. And so I celebrate Christmas each and every day of the year. Christmas is a baby born in a manger who came to hang on a cross that you and I might be set free. That's it, church. If you go back, one of my favorite little clips is in Charlie Brown Christmas when Linus stands and explains the meaning of Christmas. And what does he quote? Isaiah that I just read today. For unto us is born a child. Unto us. Somebody get this. So you can say it this way. Unto me. There was born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Father, I thank you for the privilege of standing in this pulpit. I thank you for allowing me the strength today to conquer this flesh. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that there are people who heard today, and I pray, Lord God, that their spirit man would be set free. No more bondage from the things of this world. Lord, we have been set free because of the Christ child who grew up to be the sacrificial lamb, Lord God. Father, we thank you for freedom that we have in Christ. I thank you that Christmas is not one day a year, but it is a way of life because of the, the grace that has been bestowed to us 
through Jesus, your son. Father, let that ring true in somebody today. Father, let them understand Christmas is not about the tree. There's nothing wrong with celebrating it. Somebody hear me. There's nothing wrong with the tree. There's nothing wrong with the gifts. But understand, that's not Christmas. Christmas is God loved you so much that Jesus left the splendor of heaven, took on human flesh, walked this life to perfection, died that we don't have to. And today I stand clean through all of my ignorance, through all of the times I've blown it. I'm clean, not because of my righteousness, but his. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for freedom that I have found in you. Thank you, Lord God. Father, go with these in this church, those that are watching online. Let them really understand, maybe for the first time ever, the true significance of Christmas. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for what you're going to do as you liberate them from the bondage that this world has put them in. Let the kingdom authority be released. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. I realize, let me just share this real quickly. I didn't get the announcements done because I was tied up with some other things, and so I meant to announce it. We are doing candlelight communion, and I know as sure as I say it, somebody's going to say we have family plans. Understood. But for those who are free, Christmas Eve, it was on Monday, 7 o'clock, we're going to be here for a candlelight communion service. A few of you have been here, and you're, those you have not are going to have a hard time understanding that pastor means it when I say it. 30 minutes in and out, we're done. We're going to come in. We're going to share a very brief word, a communion. We're going to say Merry Christmas, everybody, and we're going to go home. But I cannot face Christmas without putting the meaning back on Jesus. If you can't be here wherever you are, I ask if you do that, take a couple of minutes with your family and put the focus on Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.